Welcome to Popcorn Psychology, the podcast where we watch blockbuster movies and psychoanalyze them. My name is Brittany Brownfield, and I'm a child therapist, and I'm joined by... Ben Stover, individual therapist. Hannah Espinosa, marriage and family therapist. We are all licensed clinical professional counselors, also known as therapists, who practice out of Chicago, Illinois. Even though we are licensed mental health professionals, this podcast is purely for entertainment purposes and to fulfill our love of dissecting pop culture in all forms. And today is the first of a two-parter um, about men- about mental health and substance abuse. So today we're going to be talking about the divine secrets of the Yaya sisterhood, and then our second parter will be about fear and loathing in Las Vegas. We wanted to do this during um, Substance Abuse Awareness Month, but uh, we fucked that up. Um, so we're just doing, <laughs> <laughs> so we're so we're just it, doing uh, it as a two parter. But our lives happened, and so we couldn't. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, because we wanted to show two very different presentations of substance use, because it really isn't a topic we have tackled yet. Mm-hmm. on this podcast so yes yeah, so divine secrets of the yaya sisterhood based on a pretty popular book i think in the 90s it, i remember it being a very culturally a big deal when i saw it because i didn't read it but like i went to the theater with like my grandma and all of my aunts and they were like all so fucking pumped up to see this movie so it's basically about sandra bullock ashley judd it's about um it's told in a flashback sense. It's just about like a current day Sandra Bullock writing, learning about her mom's substance use when she was a kid and kind of all the secrets that were surrounding it and how it impacted their relationship nowadays. And Ashley Judd plays the 60s version of her mom, Vivi. Vivi? Vivi. Her Vivi. name's Vivian and they call her Vivi. Vivi. So Vivi is the mom. Sita is Sandra Bullock's character. I have to remember that. Yeah, as we're talking about it. So basically, we're going to be talking about substance abuse and um, specifically enabling kind of functioning alcoholism and then like the cultural and generational aspects of substance use. We're also going to be talking about family relationships and secrets, communication, and how that had an impact with the substance abuse and mental health on relationships overall. So we can jump into it. Substance abuse. What are we seeing in this movie in terms of substance use? I mean, I think we pretty clearly see an example of functioning alcoholism. Throughout. There's like, I remember, I don't know, I feel like the amount of Bloody Marys Mm -hmm. I saw in this movie, constant, constantly drinking Bloody Marys at all times of day. And critiquing them. Yeah, and having a lot of different, like when she's full out sobbing, and she drinks that Bloody Mary in the beginning, and she's like, it needs more salt, or whatever she says. Tabasco. (laughs) Tabasco. Which is my constant complaint, too, about Bloody Mary, so I respect that. Well, and even the, every time they show the mother, she has a drink in her hand. Mm Mm-hmm. So, I think every time you see any of the older women. Yeah, they almost always have, are almost always mm-hmm. all drinking alcohol. Mm-hmm. And there's very much, like, an understanding that's just what you do. And that's what I mean by kind of, like, the functioning alcoholism. Kind of everybody drinks. Mm-hmm. Nobody really talks about the fact that they drink. And if they do, it's kind of in jest. It's just very, like, oh, you know, honey. Or, like, like we all have to drink or whatever. And it's also, like, one thing I remember noting is... They've been drinking all day because they kidnap Sandra Bullock's character, take her back to Louisiana. The three well, they drug older her. friends they right, roofie they, they her, they roofie her, they which roofie we, her. I guess we'll just slide right over. Right. Her. She she is a playwright and then she writes a review with uh, goes to an interview with Time Magazine, which her mother then sees, which creates the whole conflict at the beginning of the film. Yeah, and so her older friends kidnap her and bring her to Louisiana via right. Rahupnal, but which her. With fiance the, with help, the help of her fiance. Okay, we can get that later. Yeah, we'll talk about it. <laughs> but, um, so, but there is this thing Robert where, like, Bruce. yeah, yeah, where they're just, like, they've all been drinking all day in that cabin in Louisiana, and then the one of the older women, Teensy, goes to leave to drive home, and they're like, can you drive? She's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> like, she's probably been drinking all day, which is, like, kind of, like, part of functional alcoholism, too, where it's, like, do you, like, drinking and driving is, like, not, cons- it's, like, not a thing. It doesn't exist. Like, everyone's like, yeah, you could, what are you talking about? You can drink a drive. What? <laughs> like, which I think kind of also calls back to, like, the cultural generational part of it, too. Which is, we all drink. It's not a big deal. For you to point, th- I bet even for her to ask that question, because I think it was Sandra Bullock's character to ask that question. Like, probably felt yeah, like such a weird question to ask. Yeah. Like, huh? What are you talking about? And, um... But yeah, like there's constant drinks in everyone's hands when she tries to, um, what am I thinking of? At the end when, um, Vivi's character is like trying to pray to Mary to not drink as much. She's like, well, I can have one drink a day 
maybe, is as much as she was able to commit about not drinking. So we see a lot of women in this movie drinking and it not being a big deal and being able to still have conversations. Like no one ever appears in the present day. No one ever appears drunk. Right. They're all still having communication. They're all driving. They're all chit-chatting. They're all doing their thing, even though they're all clearly imbibing alcohol constantly. And then so what do we see in the flashbacks to the 60s? Because this movie takes place half in the present day and half in the 60s. Right, half in, what, the 90s? Yeah. Early 2000s, maybe? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then Mm -hmm. the rest in the 60s. And some before. Some in the 40s. 30s. That's World War II. Well, no. Like, well, it goes through the 30s all the way up through, like, the late 60s, early 70s, and then present day. But in the flashbacks, where do we see substance use? I mean, I think you see evidence of alcohol use throughout. Mm-hmm. I think that did I her think it's parents. Con- just, it's just consistent. Just consistent. Yeah, like, like you see her dad. I don't think, except for when the ring incident happens, I don't think you see mm. him without a drink. Mm-hmm. I don't remember if we saw her mom with a drink, but his her dad always had a well, drink. Well, probably not her mom, because her mom is a crazy religious person. So she probably doesn't drink at all. She's probably a teetotaler, if I had to guess. Mm-hmm. Vivi's mom. But yeah, you constantly see alcohol. I think every single scene from when they're in their teenage years and on, with the exclusion of, I think, when they're, like, riding bikes, <laughs> they have a drink in their hand. I mean, they don't drink alcohol when they're little girls. No, I mean, I mean, like, from teenage on, I mean. Oh, from teenage on. Okay, Yeah, sorry. like, they don't drink when they're literal children. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say. Oh, <laughs> but right. every time, like, even when they're all before they get in that car and start stripping, like, they're all drinking mm-hmm. in the bedroom, mm-hmm. kind of sweating it out. Like, when they go during her, like, you know, obviously during her coming out party, debutante ball, whatever, they are all drinking alcohol. Like, it is this understanding that you just, everybody drinks, and that that's not even really, like, talked about that much. Because I would say even in this movie, even though it's very clear, well, no, I don't even know if I would say it's very clear. Because I guess the big breaking point of this movie is that she has a nervous breakdown at one point because she's given medication to help with what I guess is alcoholism help with her drinking but they don't really ever talk about her alcoholism like it's a problem before that situation like she gets a little too drunk it's all kind of like covert Mm -hmm. and like subtle but they never really show a situation where everyone's like oh vivi's out of control you know what i mean where it's like a big you know big splashy incident i think that's all just the problem with it why it's like a a functional situation and there's so much enabling in the family is that there you see that it's just accepted that mom drinks, and it seems like her mm-hmm. drinking got way worse uh, after the fiance died. Yeah, definitely, she fell into because when she marries Shep, like she's very clearly been drinking. Like that night when she comes home and she's been making dinner, and she burns it, and she flips out on him because he tries to touch her, mm-hmm. and then they have that fight, and she like she's probably been drinking there that night when the kids are all sick. And she accidentally gives her kid vodka Mm -hmm. because she thinks it's water. And they make a very clear, like, point of, like, panning in on the glass before she wakes up. Like, there's, it's, I mean, this movie actually does a good job of portraying functional alcoholism because it's very covert. Like, it's just, like, always there, but it's never, like, a big to-do. Right. And I think that they, um... I think that they... I lost my train of thought already. Forget it. <laughs> we'll come back to Hannah. Yeah. The, Fuck it. When, but the... I think when you see in this movie is that it's a great example of... From the perspective of... Uh, they, they shoot the movie almost like it's uh, another member of the family who's seeing everything kind of happening. It's like, the, the, it's like the eighth character of the movie. Yeah. The camera's... Yeah, that's a good way to put it. And I think that... What the way that the perspective creates is that as you're watching the film, you realize how the alcohol is so interwoven that it's not even questioned mm-hmm. until they make a point of like kind of switching the tone of the film a little bit to capture more of like how much of a role alcohol has played in some of the dysfunction that goes on. And I think this movie does like a great uh, job of giving you the depiction of what it actually looks like and how someone might perceive it as going on like, well, this alcohol is just always here. It's always a part of it. And like they don't. There's sadness about it, and the kid's going like, oh, mom's kind of drunk again, but never... It's do never see, like, like, mama needs to stop drinking. Like, there's never that speech in no, the No, there's no there's no intervention. There's no big moment. It's all a lot of 
Is that, did your brain come back? Yeah. Hannah's back. <laughs> um, so also I think because there's a cultural, the cultural aspect is also that you don't intervene in other people's families. Because I think at that time with that generation, there were so many things that went on in families yes. that nobody ever checked in on, nobody ever asked about. And I think part of that is just part of people just thinking that everybody's okay and or you keep it in your family and nobody else needs to know. So I think, and at the end of the movie, one of the women, one of the girlfriends um, says, we should have checked, we should have checked on you more and mm-hmm. we should have said something. We didn't realize her drinking was that bad. It's like, right, because you're all fucking alcoholics as well and also didn't realize it. Yeah. So, but I mean, even when like, even when they show after the mom in the, the, in the 60s after the mom had been away and they show Shep at that event at somebody's house and the one little girl is coming up to him and just like tugging so on his yeah. oh no the little girl no the little Bela Baylor I think Baylor's the boy I don't know what their, all I don't their names know what their are fucking names are either. there's like four or five of them did they ever give the other kids yeah like, they've names, named really? them all they Lulu's had... one it probably was Lulu it was probably Lulu Baylor but the way that she's like her. tugging I thought that that was actually such a good example of having attachment Mm -hmm. problems the way that she is just like she's pretty old to be just pulling on her dad trying to get his attention Mm -hmm. i'm like that's an act of like a baby Mm -hmm. and she's probably like six Mm -hmm. so and how he just breaks down and starts crying and Mm -hmm. like how nobody it's just so how just nobody asks even though it's clear that something is happening Mm mm-hmm which is where I think we come out of that, and I don't know if historically this is correct, but mandated reporting is probably part of what happened after these kinds of things would just happen, and nobody ever did anything about it because it's just, oh, it stays in the family, and they'll figure yeah. it out, and it's none of our business. And I think it's also one of those things culturally, too, where if we're all sort of drinking, even though we're all not like, we're all at different levels of if it's a problem in our lives, you don't want to... If someone starts drinking, stops drinking because it's a problem, then it's like a bummer. You know what I mean? Like, I mean that, like, it sounds like I'm, I'm not trying to be glib, but like, it's like, you don't want it to be like, oh, that's a thing or we can't all have fun or like, you know, oh, don't be a, don't be like, you know, like well, because- a poop, like just have a drink. Like, like the kind of like putting it under the rug because it shines a light on everybody. And so it's like, well, we don't want to deal with that. And so ever, just come on, just keep drinking. We all know that you can only have like three. So we'll just keep an eye on like make sure you're drinking. It's like, that thing where too, like so we don't want to deal with it. We cushion the situation and we enable the situation because then it makes us have to look at ourselves cult like as a whole. And that feels very bad. Like that no one, I guess, I think part of it too is, is no one wants to think, how was I part of this problem? Mm-hmm. There's so much pride that everyone also has part of sweeping it under the rug and enabling in this situation with substance use is because well, we were all kind of drinking. So we just let it keep happening Yeah, because we were all drinking too much and acting too loose and maybe taking too many pills. Cause also the sixties was is kind of known as like the generation of like pill popping, you know, being on quaaludes and barbiturates and this thing we're going to talk about in a minute, like Dexamil, whatever that was, which I hadn't heard of before this movie. And So I think there's all this, like, no one talks about it because then you have to acknowledge what's going on with you, which is part of how enabling works so well, Mm -hmm. quote unquote, is because it's just, like, keeping this circle going where no one's ever really at fault and no one ever has to stop having a good time either until something falls apart and then we just don't talk about it when it falls apart. Right. Because there's a thousand steps anybody could have taken leading up to when she finally has her, like, break Mm -hmm. in the movie. Because it was, like, a long time coming. Like, she went off and she, like, went to that hotel for a few days. Like, she pawned her ring and I guess got it back. Like, yeah. she had all these fights with Shep where they're screaming at each other and she's, like, batting at Shep. Like, they're getting physical with each other. Mm-hmm. I'm sure she was up acting a fool around her friends every once in a while because they're all so enmeshed with each other. Mm-hmm. But I think it is one of those things that's, like, well, we don't want to, we also don't want to stop drinking because we're dependent on drinking so we just don't talk about it. Because also they're all so close that if she really stopped drinking, they'd all have to stop drinking, probably. I mean, I would imagine that that would re- that they would might have to stop being friends. Yeah, I mean, I think part of what is so hard for people who are struggling with alcoholism is that drinking is so socially acceptable and yeah. so still. I mean, it's still fucking socially acceptable. So, and that a lot of times the really hard part is that you have to change the people you're around. You have to change your mm-hmm. kind of 
the things that you do to manage. And so it's really hard to, and especially with the bond that she has with those women through her own, because of her own trauma and Mm -hmm. uh, situation and being really connected to them and feeling really safe with them. And then they're the ones who are enabling her and having to walk away, not only from her one coping skill that she uses on a, has used forever, as long as she could hold a drink in her hand. Um, And then to have to also lose all of her supports. Yeah. That's a lot to ask. And that's and that's also something in the 60s that they didn't really have a lot of awareness of what of how to treat substance use and the, yeah. or the medications that they're just handing out like it's no big deal because at least it calms people down. Like it'll just calm down. She'll be calmer. It'll be fine. And then she won't be mean to the kids anymore. Right, she'll be mm-hmm. manageable. Yeah, it's more, like it's more like sedation, less actually curing her. Yeah. a situation. Let's just well, and even like the straight up denial that Shep is in when they show that part where she um she when she has the psychotic break mm-hmm. and she's and, been sedated and she gets sedated and he's like, no, like she's okay. She just needs to eat. Like sometimes she just forgets to eat. And then he tries to, to that, force that feed part, her. That scene where he's putting that sandwich in her mouth is hard to Yeah, watch. it is. And it just, like, in his... And kind of, like, he even says to um, Sita when they're having their kind of, like, um, one-on-one, they have that a couple of times. And he's like, well, we just weren't equipped with the tools that we were supposed to have. And I was just waiting. I so, at first, he's, I can't remember what he said, but then he says that he, then he just got out of the way. Like, mm-hmm. he tried things in the beginning, and then he just stopped trying and just made sure that he wasn't in the way, which then meant that he was then more, that much more absent for his children. Yeah. Which you kind of see in the movie. It's hard to but tell. Either, but either yeah. way, he's not doing anything. He's enabling her, because yeah. he's not making her responsible. He's not pointing it out. Nobody is. Mm-hmm. It's like, what the fuck? Like, these kids are, so the kids are just going to be fine? Like, we're just going to act like that's no big deal? And I wonder mm-hmm. if that's more of the cultural part of our parents also drank like that, and therefore, and we were fine. Like, we're fine. Every once in a while, you know. just get like, crazy and, like, slap your kid. Like, yeah. I think, I mean, like, belting, very, like, the, yeah. I mean, she definitely took it, obviously, way too far, like, the, well, yeah. the, like, the, people who worked there intervened and like grabbed her and like oh but i think i mean that slides into like the enabling like shep is the enabling type where you're just like ignoring and in denial and you're just like i think it's not a big deal whereas and then we see all the enabling with her friends and that they just they also act like it's not a big deal but i mean in the present day their first thing when she's in distress after her daughter wrote that review is to make her a drink and they never really say in this movie which i think is the point you brought up hannah before we turn on the mics is like so after she gets out of the hospital she just keeps drinking because it's present day and she's still drinking a bunch and her friends are still like that's the first protocol is you know make vivi a drink you know is it a good you know what i mean like everyone's still drinking (laughs) like nothing happened and like they're still acting like that's the acceptable fun thing to do and it's not a big deal and so, like, that enabling, too, where it's just they all as her friends continuing to drink around her and to encourage her to drink. Like, that's, like, classic enabling. Yeah. And I'm sure they did that after she left the hospital. Because if they were really, truly wanting her, well, like, the best for her, they probably, they all would have maybe made a pact to stop drinking. Yeah. After she left the hospital. But they probably have their own in substance the, abuse stuff. Well, in the same way that they, I mean, did something bonkers to get her daughter to repair this problem with the daughter, they fucking went and drugged her Mm -hmm. and brought her to her against her will. Like, which is also, which is also enabling Vivi's behavior because instead of going to Vivi and being like, you need to figure this the fuck out. (laughs) Can you not understand where it is coming from? Like, you know, trying to like talk her down or like they instead try to fix the problem for Vivi by bringing her daughter all the way to Louisiana and then to convincing Sita to forgive her mom. Exactly. Which is an enabling on a higher degree. Yeah. Well, it's just that same idea that, oh, Vivian can't take responsibility for her actions because her dad was mean. I mean, is that what you think they're thinking? Like, I don't know. I think they're thinking, (laughs) I think because they are her friends, so they're, they will always, they have the clearest understanding of what Vivi's gone through because they've lived it alongside her. And so they're just super more forgiving of, of her because, I mean, they've been through, they were there when her parents went berserk. 
they were there when Jack died, like her fiance, like they, so they understand her journey. They've seen all the steps there and they've also seen the best parts of her, which make them also more forgiving and loving towards her. Mm-hmm. So, but they aren't understanding. Well, they kind of act like they do, but um, that all that stuff is coloring their concept of Vivi and why they feel like Sita just needs to understand and forgive her instead of going to Vivi and being like, you are the mom. <laughs> Like, you're the mom. And also just because there was good reasons, quote unquote, for why you did the things you did or excusable reasons, that doesn't mean that she can't still be mad at you and upset with you and traumatized by you. And that's a hard truth. But that's but no one's dealing in truths in this in these. No, in this generation. When you see when you see (laughs) enabling, the problem that becomes is that what a key component of it is, is that people are avoiding awkwardness they're avoiding uncomfortability and they're avoiding pain that's what they're doing is actively avoiding changing the system yes and when you see substance use in a family like this or in a parent or in anyone you know like there's an entire support system around them that is allowing it to happen out of convenience for Mm themselves or convenience for the other person and not wanting people to face difficult truths and there's an entire culture around that especially in uh, you know like our country is that there's there's so much permissiveness of alcohol and so much encouragement for alcohol use in social settings. It, it's not like where if you travel to Europe and people are drinking strong beers and having things, but it's not such a culture of alcoholism where there's as much binge drinking. Like they may drink one or two beers and then they stop. Well, and I mean, as opposed to yeah. like this where there's so much culture of avoiding pain and not dealing with life and just allowing someone, oh, well, she's... She's in pain and making excuses for people on why they should be able to clearly damage their health and let them go like, well, when she's gone through a lot, so let's, you know, just let her do what she mm-hmm. needs to do to numb herself and numb her pain as opposed to getting to a point where you are dealing and confronting the issues. And particularly in the American South at this time period, like, they're, like they're, we're still in this like 50s bliss kind of culture especially down there like where you're looking at people who are like no we we don't talk about the uncomfortable things and like oh she's just gonna have a drink and you minimize and what happens is that the disease progresses absolutely Mm -hmm. which which we see which we do see and like it seems like she gets more of a handle on it a little bit after like the hospitalization because she doesn't appear to be reaching the point where she is absolutely wasted but her behavior is still out of line like, I don't know. Like, there seems to be, like, there's a, been a shift in it as, yeah. you know, we've progressed well, I think 30 she be- years. But... She became avoided in a different way, where it sounds like after she left the hospital, she pulled away from her kids and probably Shep entirely. Oh, well, and, yeah, they and shot, just And just kind of, she probably rooms. just kept to herself a lot. And that, I think, what had even maybe the bigger impact on her and Sita's relationship than all this stuff before, because it seemed like all of Sita's positive memories about her mom too were prior to that incident the incident yeah and um and then it seems like after that Sita part of why their relationship broke down is Sita felt like something had happened that made her mom mad at them to the point of beating them to filth and then she went away she ran away and abandoned them for six months in her perception and then after that was very distant towards them so in Sita's mind like her what- mom what yeah. little kid wouldn't make up yeah. a story where no I fucking telling them. where I did something wrong and you had to go away and now you're back and now I don't want to fuck up again? I mm-hmm. mean, in that letter when she's yeah. laying in the hospital bed and they read the little girl reads the letter out loud and she says, "I taught you know I'll make sure that Bela is or Baylor or whatever the fuck the name is that you know I I finally figured out how to get them to be quiet so they won't bug you anymore." Which is a big part of, like, substance use, too, which we see in the movies, how it impacts a family, is, like, Sita, as the oldest, is starting to take on this more parent role, where, like, after her mom storms off making dinner, that one scene, she comes up to her dad, and she's like, I'll make dinner, dad, and he's like, yeah, okay, which is so fucking, that's trash, because he should have been like, no, Sita, I'll make dinner. Because I'm the parent. I and mean, then, I agree. I don't think in the 60s you would have seen that. Yeah, though. but I mean, like, it's a shame. But and then in, way. like, the other things where she's kind of taking care of the kids and there's one scene. Oh, I can't remember what she says. But there's, oh, she's singing to her. Like, her mom's crying in the car and they're in front of the liquor store. And she starts singing to her mom to calm her down. Like, Sita is taking on this 
caretaker role kind of peacekeeper just trying to keep everything cool for her younger siblings and for her mom because she loves her mom so much and i think what can be really hard too about alcoholism but also we haven't even gotten to yet what's clearly an underlying mental health thing going on with vivi as well yeah is her mom so up and down that there's just enough good really good beautiful days that you are constantly fighting for those good days on the bad days and that's what keeps you there. I mean, she's a child, so she can't leave. But I wonder with Shep, too, like, there's enough days where Vivi is really smiley and touchy and so fun. Like, she's so fun. And everyone keeps talking about how fun she is. And if you had known your mom mm-hmm. before when she was fun. Known, yeah, I wish you would have known her when she was a girl. So everyone's clinging to these, to the bright spots. Like, even in the movie, the way they film it, there's the scene where they play the drowning game. And she stand, Vivi stands over her. Mm-hmm. And the sun is coming out from behind her head. Like, she like is, like, angel. the son to her daughter. Yeah. And so I think, especially with people that are as vivacious as Vivi when they're in their good days, mm-hmm. that's what keeps people there I and think... working for it and keeping hope that it can, they can get there again. It's like abusive relationships, too. It's like yeah. you work towards the good days all the time. And it goes through a cycle. Where, yeah. like, you know, they, they go through, like, all things are so good and then... Like, oh, you start ignoring when things are going bad and you start seeing the warning signs Mm -hmm. and you start trying harder to make things better, but it doesn't work. And then crisis happens. And then the apology and honeymoon uh, Mm -hmm. period where things are great again, like starts over. And Mm -hmm. you you see this with this family a lot, like this pattern. It's very cyclical. It's very like easy to see like crisis points happen and then things get great and mom makes some grand gesture or something happens and then... Something else happens, and the the, mm-hmm. the stress of life starts building up, and uh, the underlying depression that she has that is not at all ever one single time in this movie discussed uh, or acknowledged in any way, shape, or form. Like it's alluded to, but yeah, definitely no full acknowledgement at all. Like, the, yeah, like, we see like a clear shift in her, and like that's one of the things. The word for this is comorbidity, and the depression. Uh, and anxiety actually have high comorbidity. Like if you look at substance use, it's surprisingly enough the number one uh, comorbid condition with alcoholism uh, is anxiety. Yeah, absolutely. And I think people use it to and they use it to self medicate because they don't feel as anxious when they when they drink, and it becomes. And I think, and that's part of what this whole. I think that's part of Vivi's story, at least, especially when we think about the trauma that she's also been through. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think she's a classic example, which is why we, I think we see drinking so much in this movie and in this, like, generations, mm-hmm. is that no one was talking about mental health, no one was getting help for mental health in any capacity, um, and so you drank, and everybody drank, so we didn't talk about it, or you did something else that was horrible, but because you see many traumas in this movie, her parents won, that is, dis- the whole thing with her parents is so disgusting, one that they, it's that weird thing where whenever the situation where a mom is feeling competitive with her daughter once her daughter's reached a certain age is so disgusting. Ugh, it is so gross. Well, the mom flat accused her daughter when the dad gave her that, like, yes. diamond Incest. ring, which, uh, yeah, he flat ac- he accuses the daughter of, like, whatever you did to get that ring was against God. And also, but also her dad plays, but like her that. dad plays into that anxiety where he'll be like, this is what a real woman, like a beautiful, like a real beautiful woman. Like he said something very he specific. He says something that a young, a beautiful young woman deserves. He 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 acts, he verbalizes it in a way that gave me the grossos too. Like they're both like using their daughter as this weird competitive third person in their marriage to fuck each other over. Exactly. Uh, yes. I think Which, that's accurate. So then we create a kid who's dealing, like Vivi, who's dealing with that bananasness and disgustingness, and then where their love her, for her love from her parents is so lopsided, and then also, like, questioning if she's a good person because her mom acts like that. And so there's probably also underlying mental health stuff from her mom. And then her fiancé, who's, uh, everyone says the lover for life, dies. And so there's the also war. the generational trauma of war because mm-hmm. you see like the effects of Teensy's whole family because it's Teensy's brother and her mom. That scene where Genevieve puts that skirt over her head when she's crying on the floor, I think about a lot. Yeah. Um, 
And yeah. and then but, she ends up killing herself, I believe. Yeah, she took her leave. The French lady took her leave. Is how they put it. That's yeah. so. Mom, that's so yeah. fucking southern old school to say some shit like that. And it's also this two thing where no one's talking about anything. It. It's all like this, and so we don't learn from anything because no one really talks about it. Right. Um. Or, or we use all these weird, stupid euphemisms for it. Right. And, well, and especially like when you're talking about like this culture, like you have to remember that the world that you see in movies in like the the 1940s and 50s that gets glamorized and the 30s like it's not entirely accurate to what actually happened in american history particularly not in the deep south like when we're talking about like the reconstruction era on after the civil war like the entire culture of that area shifted entirely like the whole economic model changed so like the, there to be so much depression and conflict and there to be it's, uh, there's a, so much hatred and just generational trauma that, that started when the, the South lost that war. Like there was, but the way that the South lost the war, once Sherman and uh, Grant got into there, like they were burning cities. Atlanta burned. I know they mentioned it in terms of the... Uh, Gone with the Wind movie that they all want to see, like the burning of Atlanta, and we got to be part of, you know, the, that. But the the generational trauma that you see, like we went through the Civil War, and then there was a further war with Spain and the conflicts that were happening in Cuba, and then we went into World War One and World War Two. Like so, the people mm-hmm. that the parents saw their who had gone to war then saw their children go to war again mm-hmm. and. So many died in both of those wars, and you see, yeah. like, it's kind of like an overtone with the the pilot who dies. What's his name? Jack. Jack. Yeah. Jack. Yeah. Like you see this, like this guy that has like everything going for him, and nobody wants him to go, but he feels that he needs to go to war because that's like the thing you do, like in a, in a war like that. And he goes and takes up probably the most dangerous job that there was in the world. So, like fighter pilots' lifespan was terrible. And also, they do note in the movie she's like. You just want to impress your daddy, and that's why when he does die, the mom just reams because all this like he, weird pride stuff too. And he also says that to her. Mm-hmm. Jack says that to her when he's telling her that he's going, and he said, "Well, I have to do something for the old man." He says that that's why mm-hmm. he's going, mm-hmm. which is again something that like they don't talk about, and then they just and so this kid is just going to do this thing, and then and he goes and does it, and then he dies. Well, and this, I and yeah. and I bet that she never, I bet that she never forgives him. The dad. The mom. Yeah, no. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure she doesn't. And no. then she kills herself as... Yeah. I'm sure, that dad, I'm sure, is knee-deep in bottles of bourbon constantly. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I'm sure that there's... I mean, and in this this whole culture that you see in this movie, like there's so much avoidance of pain and avoidance mm-hmm. of unpleasantness. And it's it, also masqueraded as this, like, polite culture and manners. Yes. You know, we don't right. talk about that. We mm-hmm. don't talk about that. And I think it is just, it's all, like, wrapped up in this, like, weird, like, etiquette forum. That's just a way to blanket not talking about things. I'd like to point out that while Brittany is saying it's not appropriate, she has her hands behind her back and sitting up very proper and probably yeah. doesn't mean to, but it's, like, perfect. It's because I'm a sloucher. Perfect. I'm a sloucher. But it's, like, it's so perfect, like... <laughs> Like, your head just assumed this very, like, regal position. Well, we don't talk about that. We don't talk about that. Well, you yeah. could get your mouth full of molasses. and well, We don't talk about that. That's not pleasant. That's not proper talk. But I think, but it, I think about my grandma, who, like, that's the thing. I mean, like, even then, like, it's like, and she's, like, from Kentucky, and it's like, we don't, we don't talk about that. Like, she gets so bewildered, like, this is, the, I guess, the word I would use, like, well, uh, and, uh, like, too, and, like, disgustedly bewildered when you bring up something that you shouldn't bring up in a, mm-hmm. some certain setting. But then we'll say bananas that's things, not, and you're like, oh, my God. Problem. But anyway, but, yeah, it's just all this trauma that's not being talked about, that's being swept under the rug. And then I think also, generationally, culturally, what Vivi's suffering from, too, is um, being a victim of being a woman of that time. Like, she sure. had a lot of aspirations and goals. When she says, I wanted to be famous, the way the shame you hear, Ashley Judd, like, knocks it out of the park in this movie. Yeah. The shame in her voice when she says that to the priest. Because I think she had a lot, I mean, that's something that she talks about the whole movie, like, having a lot of aspirations. And being a very ambitious, vivacious girl. Like, probably could have done it if she was in a situation, and had enough money, you know. Yeah. That she LA. could have done it, but she f- had to get, she got married instead to a guy who was good enough. And just felt entrapped by her life 
So it's all these like so many compounding factors. Like Vivi was kind of fucked in a way. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, which I think the is part of what the movie does really well is really shows you all of the different ways that she gets into the situation. And what mm-hmm. I like is that they don't show, besides the relationship with Jack, they don't really show the romantic, any kind of romantic part with Shep. Like, they don't show the wedding. Like, in a story like this, usually, like, you see the wedding and you see the good times and then you see the bad times. You see and, the pictures of it, but that's it. Yeah, yeah, but, like, but in this movie, you don't because mm-hmm. it wasn't happy. It's very clearly stated right away that it was kind of just a marriage. Yeah. Well, I think the Sandra Bullock's character said this something to that stuck with me like the whole movie. Like, well, I think Daddy just figured that he loved her enough for the both of them. I think a lot of people do that, though. I think they do too. And the and then one of the fucking women, the her friends or whatever, yeah, yes. yeah says to her, "Well, he does, and he did. He did love. He did for a while." But he did. No, she says something like that. Like yeah. he did for a while or something. No, I think she says that she she just he straight does. up says that oh. he does. He does. Okay. He still does. He still loves her. He still does, and he still and that he does, and he did do it <sighs> enough. And it's like that isn't that's not how relationships work. And also, that's why when people like not to get on a tangent, when people romanticize, like oh, we get divorced so much nowadays, and how like we've lost the track of like what marriage is, and like we don't covet it anymore. And back in the day, like people would marry fifty years. I'm like they weren't married because they were happy. They didn't stay married because they were happy. They stayed married because you stayed married. Like, in this situation, were Shep or Vivi better off still being together till now? No. You know what I mean? Like, they kind of have made it work for them, but, like, they're still not, like, in the present day scenes, they're not communicating. They sleep in different bedrooms. God knows the last time they had sex. Probably, like, 40 years. Yeah. They... Um, they they are both are, like, longing for something with each other or something with someone, and they still don't know how to ask each other for it. Like, they both hesitated at each other's doors. Like, it's like you think that they were, like, a new, like, people with a crush on each other. You know what I mean? The way that they are, like, so, like, ooh, with each other. I think that Vivi has been in a haze since Jack died. I don't, like, I think when you see Ashley Judd's depiction of her when... Glassy-eyed. She's glassy-eyed. Even those wedding pictures, she's glassy-eyed. She's not present. I don't think she was present ever since she watched the the mother of Jack, Jack's mother, like, collapse on the floor and throw her skirt over her head and go through that breakdown. Because uh, they show, like, her, like, viewpoint. And it almost gets, like, that tunnel vision kind of effect. And mm-hmm. I, I, I think she was in a haze and has been traumatized and depressed since that point and doesn't come out of it really until, like, her and City have that big, like, uh, communication where they break down and like she starts being authentic and acting like a human again mm-hmm. as opposed to like playing a part because i think she plays a part of whoever she thinks everyone's supposed to think she is and be that fun person and she drinks it would have been, her feelings it would have been really interesting to have seen what vivi was like after the hospital yeah like at least like in some regard like we don't see what she's like at all from the hospital to now and yeah. I think that would have been really interesting to see as therapists. Yeah. Like, what was her pre... Because it's kind of alluded to. We're making a lot of assumptions. We are making a lot of assumptions. Yeah, absolutely. But... I also think... Yeah. Because I don't know how, like, she's still functioning now. Like, you think she'd be dead by now. Yeah. If she was still drinking and they don't really... De- other than her being hospitalized for six months, they don't talk about, like, how was it managed after the fact. Because what we haven't really talked about yet, besides the trauma... Is I wonder if there is like bipolar or depression or something going on with Vivi as well. Because if we look at her mom, something clearly, I mean, her mom probably is also a victim of being a woman, which is she got married off to some disgusting man and they were not compatible and she fell into it, probably like, fell into her religion really hard as a coping mechanism and it perverted her well, brain. Because a it was also bit. abusive and it was an abusive yeah. relationship. And but it- I also wonder with her mom, like, if there was some, like, delusional stuff with her mom as well, or some breaks with reality with her mom. Yes, the answer is yes. She talks to herself. <laughs> yeah. She's talking to herself oh, yeah. in the bedroom when she's playing. When- and it's not when she's just praying. Like, she's, yeah. like, talking to herself. Yeah, no, mom, mom, Cherry uh, Jones did a real good job of, like, mm-hmm. uh, portraying her as very distant and... Uh, that was her name, Buggy, too, <laughs> which is horrible when you really think oh, about it. 
I don't know what the her name is. She's like mentally ill, and her nickname's Buggy. That actress always has like an, she's always got intense characters. She's on Twenty Four. She became president. On she's like an Anna Dowd and a Margot Martindale. Like those three actresses live together in my brain. It's just like if you need a, an older woman to just kill it in yeah, a small right? scene, just hire one of those three ladies. Yeah, well, she's she's the mom on uh, uh, Handmaid's Tale. She. She's June's mom. Yeah, and Anna Dow's also in that movie. <laughs> and Lydia. But yeah, you're right, she's in that. But I think so I wonder with Vivi, like it's hard it's hard to discern because it is like that comorbid thing, like you said, Ben, where is it alcohol is it like the cycle of alcoholism where she's when she's maybe been sober for a few days, she is really brighter, or when she's kind of managing drinking just enough, she's got that brighter affect, and then when she's withdrawing or having a bad day, or is it because there is some sort of like mood cyclical thing that's with it as well that's causing her to maybe drink more on days when she's more depressed and on days that she feels good, she doesn't have to drink as much or she can handle drinking better. So it'd be really hard to discern as a as a professional, I'd almost want to wait for her to sober up to yeah. kind of give her a, a mood diagnosis. I agree. I would tell you that my feelers are tripped. Bipolar is one of my areas, so like that's one of the things. But my mm-hmm. feelers are tripped. I don't have enough evidence to diagnose yeah. her at yeah. all. Because we would want to see what she looked like after she left the hospital and was probably sober. Well, here's like the things you, you know, that are become important is that severe depression can have psychotic features, yeah. number one. Uh, and when she goes into that psychosis, that is not a manic psychosis. It is a depressive psychosis. It's also triggered by drugs. Yeah. So, which we haven't even talked about. <laughs> no, like, uh, the, the drug that she's on, like, but you know, like how the depression compounds of that. Well, we can't know, but we can like look at well, just the facts of what you see, like mood disorder wise is that when she is bright, she is very bright. She's like the life of the party. She's like playing all those games with the kids in the pool. Like, you're right. Like, she is, like, so much. She's so much. She's very full of life. Like, it's not quite to bipolar one level, which is bipolar one is, like, a classic where you see, like, two distinct shifts between, like, mania and depression. And there's not a lot of in-betweens. There's, like, two-week periods of kind of each, and they or more, and they cycle through. With her, you might see more of bipolar two, you can make an argument for, which is the hypomania, which hypomania uh, is more, it's a bit muted of what you would see in like typical mania. So people may not get full ideas of grandiosity, delusions of grandeur. They might not go through periods of time where they're rampantly having sex with people or spending crazy amounts of money or using absurd amounts of substances or doing, having in general like absurd behavior. But they certainly can get into spending sprees and uh, be more sexual and engage in more risky behavior and with her or have more energy and life to them where they don't need sleep. And I see some of that in this character where you would have to go as a therapist want to be like, we need to assess for this. Like, it's not enough to be like, she clearly has bipolar, but it's enough that when she's different, like I think the, uh, the plane scene is a great example of that. Like Mm -hmm. she like very, like who does not accept no for an answer and like there's also like a pluckiness to her character but yes pluckiness is a good word for it the way that she goes about it and like disregards societal norms and disregards everything and gets onto that like locked in mission of like no nah, this is happening and like we're gonna go through like grandiose gestures to make it happen like you'd want to be examining examples like that and when she's so bright and so sunny in the life of the party and then becomes so depressed later that those distinct shifts like are something that you'd want to assess. You don't want to yeah. diagnose them like, okay, someone's a, a bright person, sometimes it's feeling good, that doesn't mean they're manic or hypomanic. But what that could just be your personality when you're not depressed. Right. It could very well be that. So it's But it's one thing going to look at it and be like, okay, so you go through pretty distinct periods and there's not a lot of in-between. You don't see any in-between with her. There's no like, fine. It's either like dramatic and in, like really engaging or really depressed. Yeah, like either she is a like literally the life of the party. Like there's that scene where all the kids are dancing, like all the friends and kids are dancing, and she's like super bright and fun. And then there's the scenes where yeah, she is like weeping in her car. Also, the event where she leaves for days on end and mm-hmm. is sleeping so she sleeps enough that she loses a day in that hotel room. Mm-hmm. That in itself would make me be like, that's a little bit more than alcoholism. That's something's going on. Yeah. I mean, that could be an existential crisis. People do weird shit when yeah, they have true. existential crises. Like, and she's clearly having one when she, because it, it's led by that confession to that priest. Where she's like, I want to be famous. Yeah. I hate my kids. Well, and, and she, at that point, she was and then, and then what almost is it, 40, her? right? 
Probably. So that's midlife crisis. Yeah. yeah Men aren't the only sense. ones who get those. True. I mean, I think, you know, you guys know my opinion about religion, but also uh, the <laughs> fact that she goes and confesses and wants help because that's one of the only ways that she's learned. You can get like mental health help basically right? back then. And, and he tells her that you have to suffer in silence and you have to hold on to that and you have to carry that. And it's like, what the fuck, man? Like this, like even as a Truth. just, even just as a fucking human, right? Somebody comes to you and is sobbing and saying that they don't like their children and they want to hurt their husband and they don't know what to do about it. And your thing is like, well, you just have to pray to God and then suffer in silence and just fucking deal with it. I mean, that's also probably which I think. But also, I think for her, especially Mm -hmm. because of her mother's religious religious parts of her yeah. that i think that it's also a part that would be hard for her to not have gone to a priest anyway yeah because it's so clear that she has really some of her mother's very strict and rigid ideas about religion and life and being good and going to heaven and acting like an angel she they said they say the word angel in this movie like 25 times yeah about how we're like two angels in the sky they say oh about how you look like an angel or you're my like they say that word a lot and then when she has her psychotic break she has, says the whole like you need to be clean they need to be clean yes. to the kids which i'm sure is religious based exactly so i think that she that either way that we look at this no matter what i think about the priest being a piece of garbage is that it would it always would have went that way and at that time too again people really kind of looked in from what i've been told anyway priests as how they looked at doctors you did what doctors said they were right yeah. they knew everything priests were the same way when you go and talk to the priest what do you tell you to do you should just do that mm-hmm. but kind of this like not allowing especially for women right like not allowing like a man tells you what to do then that's what you do yeah and also i would imagine too for the priest and why he gave that advice then that's probably what he would give anyway i think what she confesses to even now for a woman to feel that way yeah. about her children is so it's sexist, but it's so people have stigmatized. Yeah. People have such, there's so much more judgmental about a woman feeling detached from their children and feeling unhappy in their family lives and not wanting to just take care of their kids more than they get. Like men get so much allowance to ditch their kids and, or at least to not to be disinterested. Like think about how, where the like fuck men, was men go on golfing trips and they're like, just gone all well, the time. you know, what's actually interesting is like Dak Shepard makes a point where he says, cause he's married to Kristen Bell and he goes, so when she has mom's day, I give her what I call a father's day. He's like, cause on father's day, the assumption is, well, men go off and they'll golf all day or they're doing something where they don't have to be around their kids. Cause that's their present. They don't have to be around their family and they shouldn't want to be around their family. But mother's day, it's you take your mom out to lunch. You make them breakfast in bed. Like they're still supposed to be like surrounded by their children so he's like so on her on her mother's day i say kristen do whatever the fuck you want go off and do whatever you want to do by yourself all day he's like because there's this idea that women constantly like want to be or have their kids butts yeah and they get and we get um and we get fulfillment from that and but men we shouldn't expect that of men though men obviously want to be away from their kids and like not to be burdened by their children on their day yeah. And so I think there is that thing, too, where I wonder if the priest hearing that probably disregarded her as, like, a, some, something is wrong with you. Because why wouldn't you want to be around your kids? And I think she also feels that guilt, which is also compounding everything else going on, which is why I wrote in my notes, like, postpartum question mark. Because yeah. I wonder, with already her underlying, probably, mood stuff, yeah. after then having kids, and how it impacted her identity, but also her mood stuff, and no one talks about it, and also being an alcoholic, like... She, I don't know how she can't not have gotten postpartum depression. And then she had probably four kids in, like, six years. Oh, yeah, there's, it's very unlikely that she didn't get it. Well, she is already depressed, so yeah. she's already going to be more vulnerable to it in the first place because she's already depressed. And they didn't, they didn't even write, really start screening for this until more recently. Mm-hmm. Because... We, don't, we, don't, we don't even really talk about it. We've probably only talked about it for the past, like, three years. We don't really talk about it, and we also don't talk about the other things that can happen postpartum anxiety postpartum bipolar disorder postpartum like there's psychosis postpartum psychosis there are so many other things that can happen even and sometimes even the the um partner can be also diagnosed with some of these things like there is a lot that we still don't talk about when it comes to because it's like this magical idea that once you have a baby then you just you go home and like you take care of the baby for like the first six months and you don't really leave and everything's fine because now you have this child and now your life is good i would say that 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 used to be true having just had a child a year ago uh, yeah the the attention to detail at least through uh advocate where we've gone like 
they screen for uh, postpartum at every appointment that you go to. They have oh, a, a screening for the parent, yeah. for the uh, for the mom. They don't do anything for the dads, uh, uh, which is yeah. a mistake. Uh, but the they do give a screening to the mother every time you go in for an appointment. Yeah, that's uh, cool. which is really good, and they do it. Uh, not only at like the OB appointments, but also at the pediatrician appointments, so that they are actively screening the whole time, which I think is really great. And in the parenting classes we did, they, they educated both parents on like how to watch for it and what the, the signs. signs are, and it's it's really important. But something else that I want to point out, like as we're talking about like kind of like the motherhood things, is that uh, my wife is a member of this group on Facebook called like the uh, the Mama Tribe Chicago, or and that is. Full of the most rampant criticism, hateful, and hateful, 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 judgmental stuff that I've ever seen. I'm part of a group called the Dad, and that group <laughs> brings light to my life. It is so goddamn funny all the time. Yeah. Like, like the dads are like, like they either provide like useful stuff, and there's some women that are involved in that too. But it's also like the the advice and like the the communication is either blatantly fucking hilarious. Or it's no, really helpful. <laughs> it's really helpful. Some of it's fucking hilarious. Like, like, oh, my kid keeps climbing out of the crib. Like, what do I do? How do I deal with that? The best thing I've ever seen in my life. Like, have you ever seen Jurassic Park? Electric fences around the whole time. <laughs> or put Legos around the edge of the crib. As soon as they jump out of the crib, well, they will never do it again. That's true. <laughs> or my personal favorite one, like, just the absolute brilliant, like, Flip the crib over. Problem solved. <laughs> oh my god! A cage, basically. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, yeah. I mean, I'm not. Like, but the I'm, moms yeah. gun each other. Like the dads, if they gun each, it's all clearly in jest, and that's like a, a men and women culture thing. But, they, but I think that's a part of the patriarchy, though, right? We pit we pit women up against each other. Women pit so women against they, each other, but it's, it's internalized. But it's internalized, internalized patriarchy and misogyny. Yes. Yes, <laughs> I'll give you that. But like. Where, the patriarchy. When I say the patriarchy, now, it's, it's, it's not men yeah. doing that. It's like women doing it to each other. Like well, yeah. they've been planting seeds in the I way they taught women for years. Saying. No, yes. the patriarchy is a misnomer sometimes, and that it isn't just like men against women. The patriarchy means that this is a state in which women don't support each other. Yes, and bring each other down too. Like that's the patriarchy. It's like feminism is kind of a misnomer, and that's equal rights for everybody. Yeah, patriarchy is kind of a similar idea where it's just a, 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 a system in which women are oppressed. Yes. By each other. And because we internalize it because, you know, yeah. women slut shame sometimes even more than men do. And it's like, why? Because we were raised to believe that to be the most attractive to men, we have to be good girls. And so then when we feel threatened by another woman, we slut shame. It's like a whole thing. But yeah, it is. I would, I'm not a mother. Yeah, a I'm not a mother myself. But as a child therapist, I try to keep up on certain things just to be, you know knowledgeable on what i do and i read a really good article years ago so i can't remember anything about it like in terms of where it was from or who wrote it but the gist was that because we're becoming a more secular culture parenthood is kind of becoming the new religion where it's like you do it right and it's like where it's it's kind of taken the place of judgment and morality and shame i would tell you that that's accurate and yeah. ever since i read that i think about that all the time and I think with all the mommy blogging and all that shit, it's like an Instagramming and it's like all that, like making your life perfect anyway. Also, but I think it's stop also reading that shit. But Just I would. Yes. General advice. Stop it. Like but that's people also that do advice that are bananas. That, that's advice that women Most give other women now, which is don't look any, don't get in any mommy groups because it's toxic. But it's so toxic. When my wife looks at it, I just like she shows me because she like sometimes mm -hmm. it's helpful. Like they're not all a bunch of animals in there, but like mm -hmm. they the culture of like just destroying each other and criticizing is amazing to me. And I'm like, just looking at that, like groups of men do not do that to each other. Mm -hmm. They do not do that to each other. And like watching like women do this to each mm -hmm. other. It's like, like, wow, mm -hmm. like, that's horrible. But, and I, but I would say though, it's not new in it's that no, if we're going to sure talk about not. this movie back in the South in the sixties and earlier, like, Vivi, when Vivi was a kid and her parents, like, you did that too. You're like, mm, her person's, it's all, it was all just like tea time and sewing circles and all that shit where exactly. it's like, that was the version of a mommy blog, like, or a, well, or a forum board. It was like you talking shit under your breath about everyone else's kids and, and how I they're think, parenting. And what I think is really unfortunate in this, one of the other parts of this, as we already talked about the group, the Yaya's being fucking enabling <laughs> as well, but also they are all also mothers, mm -hmm. right? And they, and in in a sense where they could have all have been supportive to each other, they are not. They are enabling her. Mm -hmm. And they are not, 
it's just really sad because it feels like a situation where when you have people who really love you and who are supposed to be on your side and they just and not that it's their fault that she can't get her that she can't get the help she needs. it's also the time and all the shit we've already been talking about but like just the fact that she has these women that she's supposed to be really close with and they don't the fact that one of those women didn't take those kids in yes. when Shep was struggling, which I totally respect. It's not so much that he was like, he couldn't raise him because he's the dad. I think also he probably was going through it so hard. And so. He sound and starts Yeah. And so like for, thing. it would have been appropriate the, the in my. Barbecue or wedding or whatever that whatever was. Whatever the fuck it, it would have like been. A pro- it could have been fucking anything in the South. Rich South fucking, people. It could have been a fucking barbecue. day ended with a Y. So we're having a cotillion. I think it was um, a and, and so. flower girl though. I thought it was a wedding. No, you're wrong. Whatever. Okay. But, um... That happens. But, um... What was I going with that? Now I lost my train I'm of thought. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I think it would have been appropriate for one of those women to take those kids in. Or even just, like, take one of them take two and one of them take the other two. And just kind of sat them down and be like, your mom... It doesn't have to be a big thing, but it could have just been, like, your mom's really sick and so she has to be in the hospital for a while to get better. You know what I mean? Use, like, concrete language. And then... But say it's not like, but she's going to get better. You know what I mean? Because it's not like a terminal illness-ish. And, and, but that alone, like, the effect that having that secret, because we don't talk about it, is so, like, it, I mean, we can slide it. Well, well, I guess we should, before we move on from the family, to the family relationships. So she gets, she's alcoholic enough that when she goes to her doctor, he gives her medication to manage alcoholism. So somebody was acknowledging that she was drinking too much. She was. And so she, she went she to the, so she went to the doctor and he gave her, I guess what, when I looked it up on Wikipedia, <laughs> it's an amphetamine. So yeah. he gave her an amphetamine to calm her down, which is nonsensical. And they said this drug was like, it was mixed. It was like two things. Yeah. It was a combination of ammo barbital and dex, dextro. Dextro amphetamine. So it's a it's a it's a speedball. Yeah, that's why she's ah, like. That's why ball. when she's counting her meds and she's like, Wah! like she's cranked. <laughs> she's cranked up. Yeah. And then she has a psychotic break because substance use can create psychosis. And so she has, and it's probably, but also like, who knows if she would might have been capable of psychosis because if she has bipolar, because with bipolar disorder you can have psychosis. With depression you can have psychosis. Yeah. And so. And by that, we just mean, like, a break from reality. And so then she... Which so I think it's like, just a combo plan. Also, if she's not drinking like she's supposed to... Like she was, you can have psychosis from coming down off of drinking. Alcohol is one of the... Is the most dangerous thing to withdraw from. It's the only one, I think, that can kill you. Correct. The yes. only one that it can will, kill you. It will, if you if don't do it correctly. If you're deep enough into the addiction and you just stop, you will have seizures and you will put yourself at risk of death. Yes. So Dexamil. Do not just stop drinking if you are. Go to the hospital. Go to a place. And you go need to detox. detox. And it was you like, cannot do it yourself. You can't. <laughs> no matter what anybody yeah. tells you, you can't. You have to go through. Your body will shut down and you will die. Yes. Um. So Dexamil was marketed as a, this is from Wikipedia was marketed as an antidepressant medication that did not cause agitation, uh, hilarious, and also anti anti anxiety drug and a diet drug. Amphetamine alone was previously been marketed as antidepressant, but under the benzodrine sufelt brand beginning okay blah, 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 okay it was intended to elevate mood while the barbiturate was added to counter the side effects of the amphetamine speed <laughs> holy ball. fuck it was discontinued in the 1970s in favor of mao inhibitors and tricyclic antidepressants but which are also not really given anymore there i guess there was a prime minister anthony eden was he in tony was he the one in the crown the one that became prime minister after Winston Churchill. I'm going on a such a yes! sidebar right now, guys. Yes. So if you watch The Crown, he says that he was prescribed it, and he he suggested the drug impaired his judgment during the Suez crisis. <laughs> like it fucked him up so bad that it like <laughs> fucked up his you political started a fucking war. Yeah. <laughs> so it was a drug in the Brit- in Britain. It was a drug to be taken by tired housewives, and so it was like. Clearly, are you guys done having yeah, whatever side sorry. conversation you're having Hannah's over there, picking children? picking at me like a monkey right now. Yeah. I feel really important to listen to right now. Anyway. So, sorry. so basically, it was kind of, I know there's like the cultural thing of like tired housewives in the 50s and 60s were just given meds and this is one of them, which mm-hmm. is like amphetamines and barbiturates and like things that either like zonked them out or f- flared Fucked them the up. fuck up. Yeah. And the, or this, which is a combo platter of both. So she just fucking snapped. She snapped, and it makes a lot of sense. It also sounds like she was abusing them, because also, 
you give medication to people that already have substance use issue yep. to to help the substance abuse issue. That's why when people do methadone and what's the other one? Oh, the other one. The S. Well, for heroin. Suboxone. Methadone and Suboxone. Suboxone. They have to get only a certain amount every day or every few days. Yeah, like a dose. Because they people understand that because you are a drug addict trying to come off a drug that's also addictive, like as a way to help with that, you will abuse it if we just give you a shit ton of it. No, they also have been known to sell it. Yeah. For so drugs, it is this does happen. So it's just this nonsensical thing. Of course she abused this drug. Right. Because it's supposed to make her feel better. And she wasn't getting help to manage any other part of what's going on with her. Exactly. So on bad days she was probably taking a fucking handful of them. And on good days maybe she was just taking them as needed. Or, and I'm also imagining she probably was having wild withdrawal on days that she didn't take as many as maybe she took on bad days. Well, if you, stimulants have terrible withdrawal mm-hmm. oftentimes. And, like, if you're mixing those, like, uh, this speedball type of drug, mixing the high and the low is what has killed a lot of the uh, musicians and artists who have died is by taking drugs like this, like John Candy for, and, uh, no, not John Candy, uh, the other SNL. Uh, Chris Farley? Chris Farley died from it. John and, and Belushi? Belushi did, too. Belushi. Yeah, that's what they died from, and that's what a lot of people and musicians have, have died from is taking speedballs, and we're just giving them to this these this mothers of and promising children. this is going to make you, this is going to cure you of what's ailing you, which is what you're going to do if so, like a doctor goes like, here, take this med, you're going to like, cool, you're the doctor, I'll. And she's so desperate, she starts taking that medicine like immediately after filling it at the pharmacy, like she's opening the pharmacy door, t- popping them. Because she's probably in such distress. For, for her to really? go to the, even for her to go to the doctor to admit that she has a drinking problem or that she's depressed, like in that time period, she's probably was having thoughts of suicide. Absolutely, uh, highly. Likely. Or she was thinking like thoughts of harming her kids, harming her husband, like which is also not uncommon with postpartum is to have thoughts of hurting your kids sometimes if it gets to that extent. And so... Well, just feeling, I think, just feeling so trapped. Yeah. You just feel so trapped and, like, you can't get out. And I think that that's part of what she was experiencing, which they also show really well in the movie The Hours. Ugh. I read that book, so I will never watch the movie. Yeah, don't blame me, girl. And... I've watched that movie, like, a hundred (sighs) times. Hannah, like... (laughs) Hannah's version of self-harm is watching, like, horribly upsetting movies. Over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. The Hours... I am though. I did just. Watch you, how many times that's have you watched? How many times have you seen Revolutionary Road? I've only watched that movie once. Oh, that's surprising. That's yeah. a, that is also what I've never even seen it, but this was making me think of that. Yeah, I read the synopsis because I was like, I don't know if I can handle this movie, and then I read the synopsis and I was like, I was correct. But so I think we've t- we've probably talked about substance use for like an hour, which is fine. Yeah, because the next part of this is how it's impacted her relationship with her daughter in this current state, and. Kind of like, which I think you've talked about in a recent episode, which is just the toxicity that is family secrets. This idea that if we don't talk about something, that people are better off for not knowing. Right. I think before we do that, like, I think we should transfer into that. But I think one thing that I want to point out here is, like, kind of actually talk about the criteria for substance use real quick. Oh, sure. Before we do it, because that's something that people, there's so much colloquial wisdom on that. It is all fucking bullshit. (laughs) Stop listening to addicts about what is an addiction. Please. Like... (laughs) The people were like, oh, that's not a problem. That's only a problem with this. It's only a problem. It or like, I'm a social drinker. What does that even mean? <laughs> it, it drives me bananas. There's a lot of alcoholism in my family, so like, I get like touchy about this, so I, apologies if I do. But the... Just yelled into the mic. I'm like a maniac. But it's okay. Go ahead. Thanks, Hannah. <laughs> loud. <laughs> yeah. I am loud. My, I always get in trouble for being loud. My that's wife okay. calls me the elephant in the room, like, just in general, not... In specific instances, <laughs> always. Uh, so, you know. But the the things with, with alcoholism and, like, substance use disorder, like, there used to be criteria whether it was, are, are you having dependence or are you having abuse? And now it's all gone. It's all alcohol use disorder or cannabis use disorder or cocaine use disorder. They took out all that criteria and instead of, like, having practitioners and clients sitting down going, well, it's not that bad an issue. It's only this. They're like, no, it's an issue, period. Deal with it. Like, it needs to be treated. And some of the things that we would, like, the questions that go through it, the the criteria are, like, continue to drink even though it was causing trouble with your family or friends. Given up or cutting back on activities that were important or interesting to you or give you pleasure in order to drink. 
more than once gotten into situations while or after drinking that increased your chances of getting hurt, such as driving, swimming, yep. using machinery, walking in a dangerous area, or having unsafe sex. How many of these have we seen in this movie so far? Uh, mm-hmm. Continued to drink, even though it was making you feel depressed or anxious or adding to another <laughs> health problem, or ev- or after having had a memory blackout, had to drink more than you once did to get the effect you want. Or found that your usual number of drinks had much less effect than before. Found that when the effects of alcohol were wearing off, you had withdrawal symptoms such as trouble sleeping, shakiness, restlessness, nausea, sweating, a racing heart, or a seizure, or sense that things that were not there were there. These are the criteria for Uh, alcohol use disorder. She fits it to a T. And many people in... The you know our, all our lives that we think of is going like oh they just drink sometimes and they have like think about what I just said and evaluate for yourself but learn to realize like not all drinking is problem drinking but when those criteria start to happen you need to evaluate your relationship with it because of the dangers we talked about alcohol is among the most dangerous substances and even though it's popular and it's easy to use and easy to get like. It has to be done in a sensible way. And if you see someone who is slipping into patterns like we see with um, Vivi in this movie, it's not something that you can just keep enabling and allow to happen because once the disease takes hold, it's very difficult to recognize from the inside what's going on with you. And they may need some help and they may not be willing to accept it. And, you know, you have to be willing to do that. But people don't see it and Mm -hmm. other people enable it. And we, we see with Shep is what happens is it can produce years of damage in a generational ways, so it's important to be aware and increase your awareness of it. Heard that. Absolutely. <laughs> and I would say, I wonder how much Vivi still, in the present day version of Vivi, still fits the criteria of substance use. I would say she does. She, she probably shoot, fits yeah, enough. She it. Um, but, enough. Well, and she I definitely, because she can't stop. Like, I can't stop. I need, you know, I don't know if she's using more, but she can't stop. So. She doesn't seem and she, as drunk anymore, but also she's older, so maybe she's just handling it better but also she doesn't seem like she does things either like i feel like she's always just at the house House, yeah probably just slowly getting into like alcoholic haze every day she drove poorly Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so the thing we haven't really touched upon which is the thing that you see it most in the onset of the movie is her relationship with sitta um sandra bilk's character and how toxic they are with each other based on this generational trauma like, they are very alike, which is very interesting. Mm-hmm. And the things that they do oh, is not... I mean, there's also the thing where it's like no one really talks about anything. They avoid. They hang up on each other. They send each other very dramatic messages via the mail. But they never really talk about what's going on. Also, I think what was I found really remarkable watching it is, though they are doing what to me would be relationship-ending behaviors, which is sending someone a burned remains of all the photos that they own of you. Her will with your fucking name scratched out. Right. When she gets the wedding invitation, her first th- when Vivi gets it, she's like, oh, set of finding it. Like, she, her affect is if they're not fighting. Yeah. And I'm like, that's, wh-. like, so that me- that tells that's me wild. how normal acting this fucking bat shit is. Yeah. Like, it's okay to fight with your daughter like this, and it's okay to, because also what I was thinking too, this is like the late 90s, like, those pictures that she has destroyed don't exist anymore. They don't exist. She anywhere. has destroyed. I'm sure she has kept some of them because that's how that's how those kind of people negatives. work. Is they have like Maybe. people, do but shit like, like that back then. But like they? she like has destroyed like a lot of her photographic evidence of like her child's her daughter's childhood. Yeah, out of spite. Yes. So it's like she's still very impulsive. She's still very dysregulated. She's like, and you see, and so that's also the part of me that's like there might be some sort of. It's, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, is it mood disorder or is it also like normalized family relationship behavior? Like, this is how families are. We fucking scream at each other and act like everything's okay. We make this very wild, dramatic gestures and then it's not a big deal. And the way that this family system has been operating for this amount of time and the roles that they've all been playing. I mean, like, she is the crazy, sick mom and she is allowed to act outrageous because the family enables that. I mean, like, the mm-hmm. whole system is set up so that Vivi can be ill. 
Well, yeah. look at the friends. When the friends see that article, they go to her house and bring her drinks. Yes. Because they're like, we know how Vivi's going to be. Yeah. It's not how we, we just like, you know how they are. It's like that whole thing where it's like, well, I'm a bitch, so I can, since I'm a self-proclaimed bitch, I can act like a bitch. It's like, no, just because you, it's accepted that you act a certain way doesn't mean that it's okay or that it should be tolerated. And it definitely is that thing where they're or all that, like, or yeah. that that is you taking responsibility because it is not. Mm-hmm. You're not taking responsibility for your behavior and how it affects other people. Yeah. Just because you're saying out loud, I know that I'm a bitch. Yeah. That's not. Yeah. So what about that? And, and it like- does seem like Sid, uh, probably because she's removed herself by thousands of miles from her family, is more adjusted. Like, it does seem like her fiancé hadn't seen these behaviors that much until these interactions with her mom. Like, slamming the phone down and stuff, like, against the counter. He was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, I'm sure he sees some parts of it, but I feel like it definitely gets dramatically escalated with the involvement of her mom. I mean, like, she's I, not like that all the time, where I feel like Vivi's like that all the time. All the time. Yeah, Absolutely. And I think that he, I mean, there's a lot of things that I don't care for about him that he does that I think yeah, I are very, um, final thoughts. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm going to decimate that motherfucker when we get to the end. But anyway, so. Damn. Uh, but like. Shots fired. Uh, he, ugh, that character. So. In, and I think what they do a really good job of in the movie is showing how the secrets that are had in the families that are, have always been that way. Like even in. Vivi's family, whatever, like all the shit with the parents and how that I mean, weird like, incesty stuff. That weird. It? Well, the and I wonder too. Also, if part of that is maybe the mother had something happen to her and was making assumptions that the same thing was happening to her daughter. Incest stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, those maybe. are. I mean, that would make sense in some way, right? It's such a leap. Something was going on. Do you think mom. it's a leap? No, I mean, like for her to take, for, like for the mom to go straight to like. That's you what must I mean. Be fucking around. Yeah. Exactly. So, like, I think so. I think they do a really good job of showing how so vivi endured this trauma and this family system that was not healthy right mm-hmm. where like she is really triangulated between her parents and this kind of like this this person who has to defend one or the other but also ultimately doesn't really feel loved because her mother in both cases in both very cases exactly so so then so then this person ends up you know loses the love of her life in a war Ends up in a relationship with a man who's crazy about her, but also is just as frustrated that she and doesn't love him. And also, where the hell is he when those kids are sick in that Fucking scene? Fucking tell me about it. He's and missing. they're all puking and pooping. <laughs> like, he's not there either. No, he isn't. So, but again, I think being removed, I think he removes himself because he doesn't know how to help. And he also makes it worse when he's there. It's probably what he feels like. So he removes himself because it's also being awkward and... But mm-hmm. what I think Shep's biggest fuck up is, is that he doesn't protect his children either. Yeah. And that he was, is that he should have protected those children as well. And he doesn't. Mm-hmm. And Absolutely. so, and so uh, then she is left. So then she's this woman who has had a mother who didn't love her and she never feel loved by and never felt really actually loved by her father. And then she has children and then, and, and it's suffocating. It is suffocating yes. her. And so then we have another system that's made where the mother is really unsure. And then, so you have the kids who aren't able to properly attach to her because mm-hmm. she is so, because she is struggling with her own internal things of the family that she came from. And a lot of times the families that we came from, that's such a long time and such an ingrained things that we learned in those families that to really make a change, we really have to either do some really serious work either on our own or with a therapist in order to really make a generational change. So what I see when I saw this like multi-generational, like familial trauma Mm -hmm. and abuse and how it comes down and how the, even the relationship and the way that those two act together. Cause I think what we see with, um, Sita is that she becomes the parentified child. Yes. Right. That's so that's, kind of the role that she takes where now she has sure to become is. the parent she has to take care of this mom because no adults around will do anything about it and so where are she also her three siblings as adults in, in present time yeah exactly that's also crazy you also you think don't she was an only child you also don't see them so i think which so, is not abnormal in an abusive family like that no for the kids well to... they probably all scatter to the four corners of the earth like she Absolutely. did like where you got away as i think yeah, I know the parental possible. child will often maintain a relationship but the other ones uh, it's not normal for them to uh they're not dissociate. as enmeshed well and also to they also separate also from the parentified child right. because they also a lot of times have a very 
contentious can sometimes have a contentious relationship because they were also their sibling also tried to act like a parent and that can be really confusing and kind of hurtful and can and damages the sibling relationship as well Mm -hmm. so and the fact that she has to do that but then also is in this role where she can never win Mm -hmm. and then her mom goes away and nobody tells her what happens Mm -hmm. and how I know that people sometimes don't want to tell children things because they feel like it will upset them. And especially during this generation, right? Like, yeah. kids are kids. They don't need to know. They're not affected. Blah, 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 blah. They'll just bounce off of them. But that's not the truth. Mm-hmm. When you have, which I think we've talked about before, when you have a secret in a family, you leave a child to make their own narrative about what is happening. Yes. And, because, and it'll be about them. And it will be about them. Because, Always, cause because they're egocentric. Exactly. The, developmentally, they can't make a story that isn't about them. So Sita, who I think she says she'd been in therapy for like 15 years. Yeah, would she ask for like all the thousands of dollars she spent on therapy back? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Which still I think is not a whole ever seen where they're like oh we're fine now it's like complete fucking horse shit anyway so um yeah so i think so i think what we really see is the these families who are just so dysfunctional and so and so disconnected in a very Mm -hmm. specific way i think it makes a lot of sense that we don't see the other siblings and that they're not even in the story yeah i wonder if in the book there's more of that because i know it's based on a very famous book so i bet you there's a lot more flesh and i would hope so but Ugh, I just think it's, yeah, there's so much just excusing Vivi's behavior and Sitta, just the fact that everyone's acting like Sitta's the pill. Sitta fucked it up. Sitta needs to understand. Sitta needs to forgive her mom. Sitta needs this, Sitta that. And there's like, it's all excusing Viva being bonkers and Sitta needs to be the one that comes around. Is just from the perspective of Sitta's the child and Vivi's the parent is stupid. And also, it's just this thing where Sita already feels like she did something bad as a kid, and she's the wrong one, and she's the broke one, even though her mom's clearly ill. So it's continuing this narrative for Sita as an adult that she's the one who's not who's wrong, and Viv- Vivi's allowed to be how Vivi is, and but Sita can't. She's not allowed to be, even though she's acting just like Vivi in a lot of these scenes. She's still not allowed to be the way that Vivi is, which right. would make me so fucking resentful. I'm, mean, you know what I mean. And then I also get the whole thing which we haven't even talked about, which is her not wanting to have kids of her own. Because she doesn't want to repeat the pattern. Which, which is, is not abnormal. Yeah. No, it isn't. Mm-hmm. I have had clients tell that to me. Like, I don't want to have kids. I don't want to continue. I don't want to pass on whatever I've got. Like, you know, I, I, I've heard that many times. And it's you know, it's hard to hear that people are had such a bad time with their life that they don't necessarily want to add more life mm-hmm. that could continue that pattern to their lineage. And it's... Mm-hmm. To think about the level of impact something can have on you to hit that point is scary. Yeah, and but I think it's more common. I think it's, like but I think it's impulse. more like, common than we talk about. Yeah, I I, think it I'm is. sure it is. And I also think to also feel that way, but then to also still have to be in a family where these things are still happening. Like her mother, the way that her mother reacted about the article that, as we know, reporters take shit out of context all the time, that didn't even hesitate at the fact that maybe that that was what happened and automatically went to like... Freak, like screaming on the phone but also it's yeah, another yeah she didn't even talk she just like no. as soon as she got on the phone she... but it's also <gasps> like banging the phone on yeah. the it was bananas it was bananas but that version of avoidance too where yes if I read Amen. an article if I read an article someone wrote about me as a mom that I, that I had a very bad childhood I would feel so guilty I'd probably cry for three days like if I were to like that, my mom read it, she'd be distraught and she'll probably be calling me like begging me for forgiveness. Like, you know what I mean? And the, so the fact that when Vivi reads the article, even knowing that she's done the things that she's done, she doesn't argue that she's done the things that she's done. She still is like, how dare Sita? Like she writes, she says, I wrote it down. She's supposed to be the good one. Mm-hmm. She's dead to me. I was in labor for so long. They're like two hours top. She was like, shut up. Which is also like that very hyperbolic, which to me speaks of sort of like a mood disorder, personality disorder, when it's like everything is like exaggerated and out to like the nth degree. Yeah. Where it's like all hyperbolic to to make you the victim. Yeah. Because Vivi loves being the victim. She does. Well, there's also with her that they talk about the friends. It's more like the subtext of what they talk about. But it's also like kind of stated in ways that reinforces the point I made earlier about like she is cultivating an image she wanted to be famous so she's like an actress 
she's always cultivating an image of being that wife of the party. And, and then when she gets publicly shamed by her daughter's article that goes against every image she tried to cultivate outwardly. And now mm-hmm. she's got the shame of like, what will the community think? Which is a huge thing down in the in the South. I and think it's a huge culture. thing, but it's also a huge generational thing of that time period, no matter where you are. Of course. But like, if, especially there. And like, look at her in like that high society. Yeah, she was a debutante. Southern, so yeah, that makes sense. The, for high society Louisiana down there, it's like to be shamed like that, like to have this entire image she spent her whole life uh cultivating even though it's bullshit like to have everyone believe that and everyone tricked into believing that and then have her daughter like shit on that like publicly mm-hmm. whew, that's probably the worst thing she could have done to her i mean that's yeah. what it seems like and that's certainly the fucking way that she acts and i mean and i think that um also i think another part that really shows because even like the yayas are they're like a part of the family system that they're that they contribute to is even when because also they assume that telling Sita about her mom being hospitalized, that that is going to then heal all the wounds. Like, is, once she just knows this thing, is, then it'll is snap madness, into place. And then they act like that works. But anyway, either way, they also don't make Vivi take fucking responsibility and be the one to tell her daughter, because that would have been a healing conversation. Does Vivi apologize at all in this movie? At the very end. She does at the very end, but even she says to them, I can't be the one to tell her. Here's the problem with that. You're, they're still enabling her to continue to not have to take responsibility. Mm-hmm. And it's even when it's information that her daughter should have. And I think that conversation could have been more healing than the one they pretend to have on the fucking porch where she says, I'm so sorry that we didn't share this with you. I was hospitalized. Mm-hmm. That's where I was for six months. And I was really sick. And I wasn't treated the way that I was supposed to have been by the doctors that were around us. People didn't know what they know now. Like, how, right. what different of a conversation would that have been? I mean, clearly in this, it's the movie and like, whatever. And she was committed. Magical realism. She was committed. For six months impatient. Hot damn. Well, they also just had put people in sanatoriums. hospital. Just yeah. Sanatoriums. Sanatoriums. Well, well, like, and they show her in the hospital bed, just like sedated. Like, yeah. they probably just brought her in well, like and sedated her. For right. like, yeah, yeah, they, like seven she months. was committed by a judge. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because she gets arrested. Yeah. And also, I'm sure that all this is bringing up the trauma for Vivi of that period when she was found out and got hospitalized. So I'm sure this whole review article in the magazine is probably bringing up all those feelings and she's having a trauma reaction, which does make you hyperbolic. Yeah. It does make your reaction Absolutely. not meet the situation at hand, even though it is like a very disgraceful moment. Like, regardless, like it would bring up a lot of bad feelings. And I think, but I think it's just that thing, which is like, this is the part of the movie that is magical realism, not real life. This is a movie, yes. cinematic mental health, which is that you can have a very specific conversation or have a bit of knowledge and then it'll dissipate all the anger and hurt and you felt and all the misunderstandings. Because here's the thing. What would be really more realistic and also very powerful for Sita is if they all would just fucking acknowledge that she can have empathy for her mom, but also still be angry with her mother. Absolutely. Which is where therapy makes things happen and where things get done in therapy. Like, cause you can have a specific conversation with a therapist that might create an aha moment and that might create change. We've all seen that, but the difference is, is exactly what Brittany is saying. It's like acknowledging that someone is allowed to have multi-layered feelings about this kind of stuff where, Yes, finding a perspective shift like she does is the entire basis of cognitive therapy. And, go ahead. Oh, but, like, you cannot get to the point where you're, like, just forgive mom for everything. Like, it doesn't work that way. Like, you have to allow the person, like, it may help you to re-examine the perspectives and realize that the way you're looking at it is through the eyes of a scared and hurt child. Like the way that you're interpreting, and you may not have all the information, and there may be more to it, and it could be helpful for you to consider that perspective of what else might have been going on. However, that does not in any way invalidate your feelings, and it makes mm-hmm. like it's okay for you to be angry about what happened, and it's okay for you to need time to process it and to take space, and you can also decide to never do it, but do so actively, and to have someone guide you through that process of going like, let's talk about everything that happened and kind of re-examine where you may have dysfunctional thoughts about it so we can figure out where you might be holding out of things that aren't so true or are biased, but also acknowledge that your feelings are just as real. Because I think the real damage 
for Sita is not even just the really traumatic incident where they get beat in the front lawn. Right. The real damage is all the stuff after that where yes. no one talked about it. Her mom still has this very like black, like this very like up and down angel devil mentality with her where either she's like puts her on a pedestal or like she's the devil. You know what I mean? Like there's still so much dysregularity mm-hmm. after this hospital situation that I feel like that is the thing. Like if her mom had just beat them on the front lawn, got hospitalized, and then everything after that was a lot better, then I could understand maybe this revelation would bring peace and maybe make things better. Maybe. Like, just instantly-ish better. Sort of. But it's not, that's not the issue. The issue is that how they all handled that for years and years and years up till now, and it didn't really modify Vivi's behavior that much. And so that's the stuff that she's still allowed to be angry about. And even and even in the way that they present this to her, it still completely invalidates her experience because yes. basically you should what, understand because basically what they're saying is, well, this is what your mother was going through, so you should so like that's why that happened. Instead of saying <laughs> the way that you felt about that, like tell us more about what that was like for you because I think that we don't, I think that we weren't aware that there were so many things going on with you at that time. Mm-hmm. Like they're still trying to make excuses for mm-hmm. Vivi. And I think Sid is probably because she was the parent parentified child. Parentified. Parentified child. Um probably looked best. Like she probably was holding a lot of it inside and uh, you know arguably successful now. She's got to play on Broadway all this stuff like getting engaged da, 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 da. she probably on paper to everybody fine. She's fine. Sid is fine. You know she's in New York so she goes to therapy because you know that's how New Yorkers Yankees Ex- do it. Exactly. And And so I think we also neglect the child that is keeping it together. But that child sometimes arguably is the one that's suffering the most because they're not dealing with anything. Like at least other kids who may act out, like that's still really negative. And I'm not saying one's worse than the other, but there is this idea that the resilient, quote unquote, resilient child is fine. And so you don't need to make any amends with that kid because they get it. Mm -hmm. And so that is also those kids will have the deepest resentment because they got their childhood like stolen from them. Yes. And they had to grow up and take care of their parent because no adult. And they get all the praise for that, too. And which they is get all the praise. Too. Well, you're like she was the good one. And your mother couldn't have done it without you. Or even like the mother saying that I couldn't have done it without Rochette you. Being and, like, appreciate you, baby. Yeah. Like, fuck you, dude. Like, yeah. you should have been there to protect me. You should have acted like my father. You should have found a safe place for us. Is Shep the go? real villain of this movie? If we're going to have a villain. And also, like, Husband. her, her, the like, <laughs> you think so? Mm. But I think also Shep, like, clearly Sitta has more daddy's girl stuff with him. Like, oh, daddy, were you loved enough? Like, you know, like, daddy was the good one that had to put up with mama. But he... But he still, he still, as a fucking adult, doesn't, again, in... Yeah. I just get out of the way. I just get out of the way. And then I learn to just get out of the way. Like, he still isn't saying to He's her, a coward. Oh, oh, baby, I'm so sorry that you had to go through this. And you don't have to worry about me. Well, you know how me. your mama is. I'm so sorry that I didn't take care of you the way that I should have. He has mm-hmm. this, like, he has this, this mentality that... Uh, she is better than him and he's lucky to have her so he's not going to do anything to risk losing her and that means crossing her so he would never check her also i wonder too like it doesn't really get discussed in the movie but i think they live in her childhood home which is that big opulent house Mm -hmm. i think Mm -hmm. and so i also wonder what kind of money he had and if he's like living off of her basically like a mechanic he was dressed like a mechanic yeah so i also wonder if well he was a cotton farmer remember it was all that shit about how she yells at him about cotton farmer hands cotton farmer yeah to put your hands on me yeah so I also wondered, too, if, like, he was sort of, like, dependent on her wealth-wise and status-wise, and so to disrupt it, too, would be to lose that stuff, too. I mean, he doesn't seem be. like that, but I'm sure that's part of it. How could I, it not I think have that's been? accurate. Uh, okay, so let's we move into treatment here. When we talk about treatment. Well, not what they did in this movie. I mean, she probably needed to go to the hospital. That's clear. When the big incident happened with the psychosis, she needed to be cleaned out. And yeah, if that's, that's when you go to the hospital. Yeah, like, sobered up, example put on good hospital. meds. Six months is a very long time to be in the hospital. A very, very long time to be in the hospital. Back then, well, I'm sure that happened all the time. I was going to say, for our standards, it definitely is. People in the hospital then, for like... She'd be in the hospital for three days. Back, or like yeah. maybe a week maybe or two if they had, had to but... monitor her medication and get her on the right meds. And also, but they probably needed her to clean out, too. To be perfectly so. honest... She'd probably go into detox and then he'd kick her out after she was clean and wouldn't even put her in the psych ward. Nowadays... I don't the know. amount of times that that would happen with people who like 
She had enough but money and resources, had, she, she, though. She that... had the kids, though. Yeah. She had the kids. Like, had she just, like, freaked out, I think that you're right. Yeah. And if also, she, the like, kids would probably kid, be taken. probably a three-day hold. Yeah, you're And probably the right. kids would probably be taken, or at least they'd DCFS, be a DCFS yeah. up in their fucking business. They would have to, yeah, they would have and, to be custody with somebody else. Yeah, I and doubt. so. Not up for one incident. Or Ooh, to be more than no, one. Well, not they have one. they have marks though, and I mean, they maybe not because because she's witnesses. been in the hospital, so like the Im- imminent risk yeah. is taken away via the mom being yeah. hospitalized. But I wouldn't be surprised if they emergency removed at least for like a week. Yeah, maybe. And put and put with like put with though. like family. I mean, um, I think I think they'd be with dad, and mom wouldn't be allowed to go home. It'd be yeah, more likely. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and I'm sure they'd have a DCF work, DCFS worker assigned to them for like a good six months to uh, a year. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, but the, yeah, the, the reality of what it takes to get somebody removed mm-hmm. that's it's excessive. It's too much. I don't know, man. I mean, I my, most of my experience is from Ohio, but I'd have cases where. I was really concerned and nothing happened. And then I had cases where I had no concerns and they were emergency removed. And I had to be the one to tell the kid that the per- their parents aren't picking them up. So it's like, oh, sometimes it's real slapdash. Like, it doesn't make sense to me. Or maybe I'm not seeing something. But that was more when I was working pretty intensely with families, too. And I'd be like, they're getting removed? I would be, like, shocked in certain cases. But, but whatever. Not to digress. But with treatment, I mean... Back then, if we're going to look at it from the 60s and 50s and stuff, I don't know what could have been done differently back then because they didn't really talk about alcoholism i don't even know how much awareness was about like mood and depression how much there was therapy even happening there was there this is the yeah. forefront of a lot of the therapies being born however uh like accessible they're just in the beginning stages and may not have been like you know she might have had to go to New and they needed for it. and yeah. they needed family therapy so like family yeah. therapy was like infant yeah. It was I mean, like I think, just starting yeah. and mostly starting with severe mental illness. So, like, not even really starting in the substance abuse field at all. Like, they're starting with mm-hmm. schiz- schizophrenia mostly, people who had schizophrenia and families and working with them in ch- California. So, like, I don't know if, you know, substance resources abuse resources wise. Even, yeah, resources wise. If I, yeah, I don't think that they Because uh, psychoanalysis. Would've... Yeah, psychoanalysis. Because ideally. Probably would have been her only part of. Probably would have would have been the most excessive thing yeah. to use, accessible thing to use. I mean, she could have afforded it. I think. Be- well, she was pawning stuff. I don't know what their their financial was situation was weird because she, she wasn't to allowed out. to take credit out anymore yeah, around oh, town. True. But because she's um, an alcoholic. But I wonder how much actual like liquid cash they had. I think they had a lot of stuff because she's like generational wealth. Yeah. But I don't know how much actual like money yeah. they had. Yeah. But um. But anyways, that's horses, also so, I mean, that's also right. a mm-hmm. digression. Mm-hmm. But. I would say in the hospital, Mm -hmm. when she was hospitalized, what probably should have happened was family therapy while she was hospitalized. They should have started bringing in the the husband. Yes. And then maybe even her friends. Yes. So all the adults first. And then maybe had family therapy with the kids. It would have looked probably more ideally Uh. like, like rehab would look. Yes. Where they start to integrate the family into... Um, treatment mm-hmm. to sort of make it so that they can work through whatever underlying issues was causing her to abuse substances and then also setting up a system for when she gets out of the hospital where everyone's in a better place about what's going on definitely Shep would have been majorly involved in that maybe even her friends maybe I don't know what that would look like but I mean they're her family so I think yes yeah I mean I, I hope would but I don't know if they would enforce it I guess is what I mean I think that they would be I think that they would be involved and I think that they would see the kids my guess would be is that they would see the kids would be seen by themselves mm-hmm. as well, like have like a session where they just either and maybe like Sita would mm-hmm. be separated out maybe because mm-hmm. sometimes what can happen if you have the whole group of kids and there's rules and secrets in the family, mm-hmm. the chances of a child being able to talk to someone is is kind of slim, and so really and like the amount of time that it would take to maybe really build up a relationship would take time. So I don't really know what that would look like, mm-hmm. and also. If they had the awareness to do that at that time. I mean, but I think yeah. that now, mm-hmm. I think that that would be something where, like, you would have the kids come in together as a group and kind of see how that worked, but then maybe kind of, like, taking the older the older one and been like, like we're going to see you individually for a little bit and just, like, see if there's anything. Because the older one has about. to trust yeah. what's going on and have to build rapport on their own with the therapist. And she doesn't have any, and if she doesn't um, believe, she can't trust any adult. No yeah, adult no one's is taking care of her. No one's telling her the truth. Nobody's telling her the truth. Nobody is taking care of her. She has to take care of her mom. She could be so wrapped up in her the idea of her mother. I mean, like, there's so many different things that would be going on there. And when you put a set of 
kids in a room and there's rules about talking and sharing like there clearly are that oldest kid is not going to say anything Mm -hmm. and neither are the other kids because they Mm -hmm. listen to her Mm -hmm. yeah especially if it's been mom's been gone for a long absence i mean the first thing i would do as professional is talk to chef and be like what the fuck why don't these kids know any why does anyone know anything i mean the forefront treatment for this entire thing is psychoeducation nobody in this movie because of the times yeah knows anything about anything and then is communicating anything about anything and it's leaving all these gaps in knowledge and understanding that are having these generational ongoing i know ongoing issues and so that would be the first if we could go back in time and do it then that'd be optimal now treatment wise it would just be also a lot of family work i think it would be because i think we see that the the roles and the structure of the family and the way that the system functions is still so dysfunctional and i mean even just having and really having a space where they can come and they can heal i mean like i'm going to be perfectly honest i don't know if sita would agree at that point yeah in the beginning like of the even movie. though she well even though she's done her own family her own individual therapy having to be in that space with her mother might be too much well also i think it's a situation a where fighter. well it's also a situation where Vivi would have to not have to agree to not take what's ever said in family therapy yep. and attack her for it later. Exactly. Which I wouldn't trust. I'm nope. so sure said I wouldn't trust that. Like I, if I'm nope. open and honest in family session, I'm going to hear about it later. That's going to be a work in progress. What for I, sure. what I think might be even what might be more effective is to try and have the siblings come in. All the other kids, the other which is kids, why and now that we're talking about this, it's why the fuck are these kids in this it's movie? Wild as adults? That we don't know anything about them, and I would imagine this is their mom's birthday at the end. Exactly, yeah, like you don't ever meet them, and so when I would have them come in together and kind of just talk to them and kind of talk about how the new information, this new information has come out, and how does that make you feel, and what do you remember about being a kid, and kind of like just letting them have a space where even the three of them can talk about it because they were kids, so mm-hmm. they couldn't have that dialogue. I mean, they were. In survival mode, what they just like remember. just like exactly and just like sit up but even having just to kind of help even repair the sibling relationship because i'm going to be honest i don't know if the if vivi has got a lot of work to do mm-hmm. and i don't know and again kind of what you're saying like i don't know if she could not take it out on them or not mm-hmm. take it out on Sita at the very least well she's got to do a lot of like which she kind of does at the very end but like ownership of what's because even if like bad things that happen to you too yeah you recreating that trauma on your kids like it's okay to you can be apologetic and you can you know and they can but and you kind of move past like the forgiveness part of it but still recognize that it had a long-term impact on your relationship and try to almost like take it less personal like it just had a factual impact Mm -hmm. on your relationship and how Mm -hmm. do you move forward with that Mm -hmm. um even though everyone can recognize bad things happened to you too and it was a horrible situation for everybody but that doesn't mean it's like the whole you can feel two feelings like you can recognize that and move forward from that part of it but still recognize and be humble about the fact that or have humility about the fact that it had a long-term drastic impact on your children and their relationship with you and their relationship with other people and until you can have that ownership on Vivi's part she, it was family therapy wouldn't be helpful because no. she would just toxify it like it would yeah. just go nowhere and it and more it probably create more strife it probably would and so a lot of it would be probably like you would probably say this like assessing vivi for family therapy individually well, before you would even uh, do it and i was even thinking about couple therapy couple therapy for her for vivi and shep might be something to help them kind of even be able to identify like behaviors and because they're still in a dysfunctional marriage like right. i mean he's still he's second fiddle to Jax to 40 years later exactly so i think 50 helping years later i think part of helping them be ready for family therapy might be really doing treatment with them if they both agreed to it and it would be like what i do which is i assess and I say, okay, here's the deal. Here are my rules. This is the only way. This has to be an open healing space. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So there can be no threats outside of this. There can be no, um, you can't take stuff outside of this room. The goal is that this is where we feel talk safe about in things. Here. It has to feel safe in here. If it doesn't feel safe, I can't do anything to help. Mm-hmm. So I wonder, too, if Vivi would benefit from DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy, just because it's for borderline personality disorder, but she displays so many traits where, like, you can't, like 
Because a lot of it is like perceiving situations clearly and rationally, reacting in a rational state, like not taking things as personal as they are, like making it such a big thing. Like the way that she handles her relationship with Sita, I think would be benefited individually with dialectical behavioral therapy. Yeah. Which we don't have to get into the deets of right now. But if if you're interested, look it up. But we talked about it in um, Fatal Attraction. She has no mindfulness at all. So, yeah, she. Yeah, grounding techniques. Taking ownership of the fact that just because you're having a reaction doesn't mean that you have to act on that reaction and doesn't mean that that reaction is deserved. Like, I think it's also the thing where I feel a certain way, so I'm allowed to be bananas. Yeah. Like, no. That's not accurate. Yeah. No, I agree. Uh, You you can't. We can't. We don't have enough information to diagnose her with uh, borderline personality disorder, but to say that she needs DBT, I think, is super accurate and is probably the best modality for her because. She's going to need to work on both getting in touch with herself and also recognizing ways and strategies to concretely intervene in her behavior to undo years of behavior that she has learned and has relied on to manipulate and exert her control over situations where she's feeling out of control. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that for me, I know that that, this is such like like a story about women, but like for I think that for me, like, my target in therapy, if I were looking at this as like, just therapist, which I am in this moment, like, not taking this movie for what it is, it's, like, definitely a huge, like, women's movie, and, like, I get that. But, like, man, Shep, Shep needs some help. Yeah. That man is so depressed. Yeah. He's just, like, clocked out. He's been clocked out of his life since he married her. Maybe before. <laughs> I, I don't would, know. About, I would like, say since, probably since her break. Yeah. I think that he was so overwhelmed and so I mean him crying at that time, a grown man crying in public. Like at a wedding or whatever that was, yeah, no. The the I think it was because somebody was guys. Like, oh, it doesn't matter. We don't have time. Go guys. Ahead. Fine, fine. But <laughs> anyway, the I I think I would want to target him. I would want to work with uh him on self esteem and self worth and value and understanding that you know, like even though he's not whatever her father was or whatever, like he aspired to be like being a farmer and a worker and however she demeaned him like he, we need to establish some sense of self-worth and self-value yes. for him otherwise he will never stand up for himself and enforce things because he'll be too afraid to lose her because he's not good enough for her also this whole fucking family idolizing jack like i'm sure he was a great guy he's very beautiful looking and he seemed like a stellar dude he also died before he really grew up that much and so He's frozen in time where you can idolize him because yeah. he never really fucked up, quote unquote. But like if they got who's to say if Vivi and Jack got married that she still wouldn't have become a raging alcoholic or they still would have gotten into it and had huge blowouts. Yeah. Like we don't know yeah. enough because they were so young. And so it does get stuck in this time where everybody in this system, Shep included, is like. Jack's memory is a huge barrier to a lot of things so in this movie. Things. So and everyone's things. validating it. Well, like, and even that thing where you do the empty chair with people, it's like you would have the whole family talk at Jack. Mm. And Teensy would have to be part of that, too. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I interrupted your treatment. It's oh. okay. Like, I, I just think, I think with Shep, you'd want to work on... Like some existential therapy and some uh, also bending CBT because you need to like start challenging hard those core beliefs he has that he's worthless or he's not good enough. He's not yeah. as good as Jack. He's not as good as whoever. Like you need to start really working with him on that. But also, how does he establish a sense of meaning to his life? Because his life is the, the only meaning he has is to support her kind of from the shadows. Mm-hmm. And, like, not get in her way, but also always be there to pick up after her. That's his whole life. That's his whole existence. At least that we see. I'm sure he has friends because he's a very lovely man. But, uh, you know, he's also very he probably depressed. has guys at, like, the local bar that he hangs out with and, you know. Well, he's always just waiting for her to finally love him. Yeah. He's just there. waiting in that room. That's all he's doing is waiting. Waiting to be good enough. And, like, that, that is something that, like, as a therapist, like, a, it's like, I see and I go, like, oh, buddy. That's, we got to work on that. Because... Like, this is not a way to live. Like you're just waiting for life to happen for 50 years. And it's, you know, like it's going to run out. It's going to run out. And <laughs> you know, you, you be looking back on life and going like, what, what where was my value? And you know, he was a father and he brought four kids into the world and he, you know, gave them a life and they, you know, at least city loves him. But the thing that it's like, he's always played second field to his life. Or fifth fiddle, you know, he's always very much in the background, and I think that working with him on how do you 
find a way to establish some sort of meaning and value and purpose to yourself and also belief that you're good enough and you deserve to be treated well. Mm-hmm. Because people who deserve, who believe they deserve to be treated well will not tolerate less. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's the difference between people who get treated poorly and people don't is they do not allow people to do that. It's not that other mm-hmm. people are going to treat you better inherently. It's that you people get the perception that they will not tolerate you treating them poorly and then therefore will not do it. And then mm-hmm. once you enforce it once, that's enough. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's yeah, that's all I have on that. I guess one thing I want to touch upon really quickly is we didn't really get into substance abuse treatment too hard here because none of us are chemically chemical dependency licensed. Like that's a whole other specialty of being therapists. That's also why we haven't really touched upon substance abuse that much in this podcast is we're just not trained in it. But I know a big part of it would be to like the enabling situation that she's in, like with her friend work. Like I don't, she could never be clean with the f- friends that she has. We kind of touch about, talked about that earlier, but the way yeah. that they all systemically drink, like it would have to be a thing where she's in rehab, look, treatment where they all have to come in and agree that we're not going to drink anymore, at least around Vivi. And also, I too wonder if living in that house where she grew up and was traumatized by her parents would also be a big barrier to her recovery. Because a lot of times, too, they talk about how you have to, when you get out of treatment, sometimes you have to get a whole new career, job, a whole new place you live, a whole new friend group. Like, you almost have to start over because so many things around you are triggers for your drinking. If not necessarily, like, makes you want to drink, but are just, like, the situations where you've always drank. Mm -hmm. And so I do wonder if why Vivi hasn't been able to stay sober is that she's still living in the house she grew up in. She still has all the kids from when she was young, like friends from when she was a kid. Like she has all the situations still where she drank yeah, or wanted to drink. Mm -hmm. And so I think that'd be a big part of this movie about this story that would have to change for Vivi to get better. Like you might even recommend like Shep, maybe you sell that house and get a new one. Yeah. You know, for her to discharge into. Yeah. Maybe. Unless that's a big enough. I mean, it has to be something you'd assess. Like, would that be too big right, of a change? Right, right. Would you flip out about that? But all, but and it'd be something you'd really you have to. another one? I mean, if they sold that house, probably they could probably get a smaller one. Well, I mean, that's a big, yeah. like, palatial it probably also, plantation back in the it day. Depends on a lot, it depends on a lot. I mean, like, are we, yeah. are we talking about, like, what time period is she getting treatment in? Because, like, we don't know necessarily how she responded, you know? Like, yeah. Like, I don't think, I think you're wrong. I think that, I don't think you're wrong. I, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, I get you. I, I realize I mumbled. Well, it's, through the it's don't hard part. because I do not think you're wrong. I think it's hard that, because we don't see no. her after she leaves the hospital. Right, we don't. But what I think like, when you look at like substance abuse, I think like the motivational interviewing needs to be an issue here. Like you need to build through uh, the resistance and work through with her. Like, what can your life look like without alcohol muting everything? Because if you don't solve that problem with her, you will solve nothing else. Yeah. And also the big thing too with the life of the party thing we talked about earlier, and how that's such a big part of identity. A lot of a big barrier to people getting sober is thinking they're not going to be fun or have any fun anymore now that they're not drinking. Exactly. And you would probably need her friends to enforce that for her and be like, we're all going to have fun and hang out and none of us are going to drink. Yep. And I think that'll just, that would be probably one of the hugest barriers. Like, I'm not going to be fun anymore if I'm not a little buzzed all the time. And the other thing that's really important with, with really with any mental health treatment, but also with substance um, use disorder, is meeting people where they are and really using motivational interviewing is one of the things that is pretty much talked about everywhere about when it comes to substance uh, substance use. Because you can't go in with a rel- relapse plan for somebody who isn't ready to stop drinking. No. Yeah. You have to meet them where they are and maybe even talk more about, like, the harm reduction model to some capacity in the beginning, which is... Like, we don't drink hard liquor, we just drink wine. Right. And trying to find ways that they can be more safe and trying to reduce some of the risk factors, um, which is part of the harm reduction model in order to, while people are in the process of deciding what they can do. Mm -hmm. And also, like we said, with her having a really firm detox plan. Yeah, because she would die. Yeah, she abso- she absolutely would. Yeah, yeah, especially when she yeah when she was younger. I don't know about where she is now. We don't know how much she drinks now, but like the, she's gonna drink in her hand the whole movie. I when mean, she's I, older. I think it's fair to think that she would need detox. Like yeah. for sure. We just like don't know. But when you see her younger, she's wasted all the time. Yeah, that's true. Like, she's like bleary eyed, like, like fucked up. Yeah, trashed. Like, like somebody who has like a couple drinks throughout the day doesn't necessarily need detox. If somebody's like blasted all the time, like they're gonna need detox or yeah. they're gonna be in trouble. Yeah, and. Uh, you can't just cold turkey through it. And like harm reduction is a model. Like, you know, like it's not just the abstinence model. That's not the only way. That's not the only path forward. And sometimes abstinence is something you have to build to. But like the harm reduction model of 
well, let's figure out a way to systematically be safer more often. Yes. Is mm-hmm. already improvement and will prove to be people in your life that you are trying and you are making changes. And that is part of the, like, that's the biggest struggle with uh, substance use people is that they've done so much damage to relationships in their life that other family members and loved ones may reject them or may dissociate with them because you've hurt me too much. And now Mm -hmm. I don't want to be with you. And like, okay, you've tried before. I don't believe you're going to really do it. And so like seeing actual tangible progress through like they're not getting wasted all the time or they're having like three drinks and stopping is much better and shows an ability to build support and trust with their support network and get buy-in from both the client and from the family to see, okay, things maybe can get better as opposed to like the impossible standard of just stop drinking. Yeah. And how there's, and there's all different kinds of groups. And I think that the most, you know, the thing that people hear about the most is Alcoholics Anonymous, but there also are um, Smart Recovery. I think there's an, I can't remember the name of the other one that I know Mm. about. Crap. Anyway. So, I mean, so there's different ways to get help ultimately. So final thoughts. I remember the thinking about this, this movie, I was really young when I first saw it. And so I think I was just like, this is fun, but also parts of it made me feel really ucky the way that things do when you don't quite understand them. When you're young. Mm-hmm. But I think it's a good movie to watch. It's probably pretty cathartic for women who've had these situations in their lives, but probably also really hard too. But I'm sure a lot of people like this book and movie so much because they see themselves on screen and how and how cathartic or how validating that must feel because there's so many topics that we don't talk about with women in particular. Mm-hmm. Substance use in general. Not liking being a mother. Like all that kind of stuff that I think we don't talk about enough with women. So I can see why this book was such a phenomenon and this movie is also so loved. Yeah, I think I thought it was a good movie and I was surprised at like how much like I was watching it and going like, oh, man, that's an issue. That's an issue. That's an issue. Like just the whole movie, like like, my wife and I were watching it. We're just like, like, like. She was like, is there going to be stuff in this? Like, I don't know. I've never seen it. I have no idea. And then I Top don't know to what bottom. T to B. Yikes. The whole time. <laughs> whole time. Like just watching it going like, oh, that's that's years of therapy. Yeah. That's that's a lot of work. That's a lot. Like, and just the whole time, like there's so very much in this. Like the, the only part like I have an issue with is like how like they like, I know narratively they had to reach a resolve. But like, so like the way they wrap it up. No, they just like wrapped it up. Like they're having this like big party. Like, oh, look, rich white people are doing fine again. Mm-hmm. But also it's that Absolutely. enmeshment thing where now you're part of our gang set up. So now we're all together. It's that right? continued enmeshment I'm bullshit. But we, can't, we don't even have time right? to get into right now. We don't. Right. Final thoughts. Connor is trash. He oh, we didn't forces, talk about him. <laughs> he forces her to do things. He's a part of the whole scheme of her getting kidnapped. Like, and I think, and he is forcing her to try to heal something that is unfair. It is not his choice when Sita is able to reconcile with her mother. Yes. That is not a fair thing to ever ask from anyone. She is clearly has been in a treatment and has been getting therapy that works for her. And asking somebody to do something they're not ready to do is not a fair thing to do in a relationship. And I mm-hmm. don't like him. And I don't like anything about him. I don't like how he also buddies up with the mother in other ways during the other parts of the movie. So... No, thank I, you. Well, I think the big and trash I, of this whole movie is how much Sita, it's on Sita to be the exactly. one that turns it around. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Which is completely unfair, which is how it had always been in her life. It's always her job to resolve her mother's trash. I forgot. I watched this movie a long time ago. I had to pause it almost immediately. There's so much stuff in this movie. This movie is hard for me to watch, and I won't ever watch it again. <laughs> You're welcome. So if anyone's keeping track of how many movies Hannah says that she will never watch again on this podcast, <laughs> I feel like this is probably like the 10th. Um, oh, we counted. It's probably like number eight. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, you can find us at Facebook and Instagram at Popcorn Psychology, um, Twitter at Popcorn underscore Psych. You can always email us at popcornpsychology gmail.com. We're always taking suggestions. Um, we also find us on iTunes, review us, rate us. This is how people find us. We really, really appreciate it. And we've gotten some really cute reviews lately. We keep meaning to talk about them on the show, but forget. So maybe next time. But thank you so much. And we will see you again soon. <laughs>